This is A View from the Bunker. Now, here's Derek Gilbert. A pastor who understands the importance of Genesis 6. Welcome to A View from the Bunker. I'm Derek Gilbert. Yes, there are some out there, and we are blessed to have one with us this evening. He is the the pastor at... um, bring up my notes here, Gulf Shores Church of Christ in Gulf Shores, Alabama. Uh, he has uh, put out a book that the cover and the title caught our attention. Josh Peck, of course, scored the uh, an earlier interview with him and sent me a private note and said, you, you definitely need to speak to this guy because he's right on target. He's the author of a new book called Gospel Over Gods. And it's our honor to welcome to the program for the first time, Tyler Gilreath. Tyler, welcome. Derek, thank you so much, man, for the invitation. I've been looking forward to getting on here with you since Josh, you know, kind of told me about you guys. And man, um, I love your work. I love the books you guys are putting out. And I just can't say enough, you know, about trying to bring on the forefront, on the front line, you know, to our churches, you know, the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, um, you know, what we're talking about today is pretty foreign you know, to most modern Christians. And so, you know, we, we're, kind, we're trying to kind of accomplish the same thing. You know, we're trying to get the message of spiritual warfare out there and how it ties into the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I appreciate the invitation to be on the program today. You know, the, uh, the subtitle, Jesus Christ, the Fallen Angels and the Supernatural War of the Bible, doesn't really um, alert the reader that uh, you dive into the Genesis six account, of course, which uh, describes the creation of the giants by these sons of God who saw that the daughters of men were fair. And uh, that's a topic that most pastors don't touch. Most churchgoers have never heard. I was in my mid thirties before I heard anybody, uh, an evangelist uh, preach on Genesis six and say, yeah, this is exactly what it means. And, For me, that was like a slap in the, you know, like a board to the side of my head. (laughs) Like, what? Because I've always been interested in in things that are a little odd. And and maybe I inherited this from my dad. It was an engineer. He always wanted to figure out how things worked. And so I immediately went to the library. Uh, The local library branch had, I think, two books on the Nephilim. One was a young adult novel by uh, Frank Peretti. The other was L.A. Marzulli's novel called Nephilim. So I blame Marzulli for getting me into all of this. But while that was sort of like the entry point, when you begin to understand the importance that those giants and their progenitors, the fallen angels, the uh, watchers, uh, the, the importance that they've had, that was really an inflection point in, in history. And yet it is not taught by probably 95% of the pastors working today. Maybe that's even a, a, a generous number. Uh, Tyler, (laughs) what was it about this topic that drew your attention and why did you decide to pursue research into it and write a book about it? You know, it kind of came out of left field for me. I had a guy here at my congregation, um, who said, you need to check, um, some material out. And so, um, you know, he, he let me read, um, I think it was, um, reversing Hermon was the first book I was introduced to that talked about this stuff. And, you know, I grew up in a, you know, a a great, a great Christian family, you know, had a great foundation and, um, you know, I'm, I'm studying and I'm reading. I went to Bible college and no one had ever mentioned, you know, the supernatural interpretation of Genesis six, one through four. And so here I am, you know, I'm, I'm kind of leading a congregation and I'm, I'm coming across this material for the very first time that was pretty mind blowing. And so, you know, I, I did the only thing I knew to do, and that's dive in into the text deeper. And so that that kind of sent me down a rabbit trail that um, I would say changed my life. It changed my walk. It changed my approach um, to ministry. And I just began to dig into study and I, you know, I studied everything I could really could get my hands on. And, um, you know, once I, I began to see that this was much bigger than just four verses, um, you know, I, I began to make some notes. I began to do more research and I began to see this thread that was interwoven throughout the tapestry of scripture. 
And I felt like I needed to put this together. I need to put this material together. Not that no one has ever done it before, but I needed to put it together in a narrative form. And so I wrote my book um, where the reader can be immersed into the supernatural war, the Bible itself, into the story itself. And there's a lot of material out there. Uh, you have a lot of great material as well um, that is, um, you know, dives into this material very, very deep. Um, but at least from my study, I was looking for something, some book, some material out there that told the story from A to Z. And I had a hard time locating exactly that. And so I felt like there was a need to tell the story um, of the great um, rebellions uh, that we find in the Bible. And so um, that was my goal. That was my intent uh, with the material. It was to not to just, you know, introduce the, the reader to the supernatural worldview of the Bible, but to immerse them into the war itself. And so each chapter has a reading the story section, uh, which really reads like a narrative, like a story. And it usually, you know, uses mostly, you know, scripture to tell that story. Uh, there's some other ancient testimonies that kind of sure that up. Um, but each chapter has that feature in it, which is, you know, kind of unique. And then, um, there's some answering your question sections, uh, connecting the gospel, which I thought was important because I wanted people to see that, you know, as you read the story, as you immerse yourself into the story, you see all these gospel connections, which show up, you know, later on in, in the gospel, but they connect back, you know, to the old Testament. So, I wanted, I wanted, you know, a chance to tell the readers the story. And that's really why I wrote this book. Most pastors come out of seminary with the understanding that Genesis six, the, the sons of God in uh, those verses are the righteous sons of Seth. Um, yeah. You, you, your research, I'm sure, has led you to the same conclusion that we have, that this was not the understanding of the early church. What was it that convinced you that the plain reading of Genesis six, that the sons of God were actually supernatural entities and not the physical linear descendants of Seth. So a couple of things convinced me. One was um, the context of the Bible itself. You know, the B'nai Ha Elohim of the Old Testament, if you look in Job 1, Job 2, and Job 38, it's very clear that those B'nai Ha Elohim or those sons of God are angelic beings. It's even clearer when you look into the Septuagint. You know, because the Septuagint just spells it out. You know, it translates that as the angels of God. So that was that was very interesting. Um, and so, you know, you plug that ancient context, that ancient interpretation into Genesis one or Genesis six, rather. And then you, you, you say, OK, well, if it meant angels of God here, then why should it mean angels of God here in Genesis six? And so, you know, even in the Septuagint, you do get that rendering. You do get angels of God uh, in Genesis 6 in the Septuagint. Um, but one of the first things that caught my attention was, you know, the testimonies of great men such as Josephus, um, where, you know, Josephus and the antiquities of the Jews, you know, says, for many angels of God accompanied with women and begot sons, these men did that which resembled the acts whom the Grecians called giants. And so I had always, you know, studied Josephus, um, you know, professors I had in school taught very highly of Josephus. I have all of his, you know, his works. And so it really hit me between the eyes when I saw that even Josephus, you know, understood that the sons of God in Genesis 6 were the angels of God and their Nephilim were the giants. OK, and so then I said, well, are, are there others in antiquity that you know, understood these sons of God to be angels of God. And I was pretty blown away with the fact that, yeah, pretty much all of the uh, early Christians interpreted it this way. For example, you have Irenaeus. Irenaeus lived between 130 and 203 AD, and he was a disciple of Polycarp, who was a disciple of the Apostle John. Mm -hmm, okay. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's a very close connection to an apostle. And here's what he wrote. Uh, he wrote, Irenaeus wrote, that an illicit union took place on the earth since the angels were united with the daughters of the race of mankind, and they bore to them sons who, for their exceeding greatness, were called giants. Okay. 
So, so there is a, you know, a man that lived in and around the time of the apostles, you know, who pretty much just came out and said, no, yeah, those sons of God in Genesis six are the angels of God. And so, you know, there was a, an array of testimonies that came out in my studies, you know, men, um, you know, such as Irenaeus, men such as Athena Goris, um, you know, men such as Justin Martyr, um, who said, but the angels transgressed this appointment and were captivated by the love of women. And so, you know, I just kept digging and kept digging and kept digging. And what I found was, you know, up until about the fourth century, Derek, you know, the early Christians understood, like the ancient Jews, that the sons of God were the angels of God. And so it was pretty disturbing to me. You know, here I was, someone that that tried to be, you know, all about the Bible and try to restore the ancient context of the Bible. And I was totally clueless um, about what that ancient context was. So. So how does this change our understanding then of this long spiritual war? What What does it mean to us Christians that those sons of God in Genesis six were supernatural and not that there's not a natural explanation for what the Bible uh, very briefly describes in Genesis six verses one through four. Well, I mean, it sets the tone pretty early about, you know, the extent to which um, angels will go to rebel against God. And that's, that's so key. Because we are in a spiritual battle, Paul said, we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against these forces in the, you know, in the heavenly places. And so we are very much you know, fighting these same entities today. And so if you don't have the background story, then you're going to miss a lot of the context that Paul talks about. Okay, And we're familiar when Christ was on the scene, you know, he was around casting out demons and doing all these things. And so... Um, the ancients would have told you, you know, the the work of Christ, of course, was to save the world from these entities, but it was also to show his power over them. And so, you know, the ancients understood that the demons that Jesus cast out were the spirits of those giants or the spirits of those Nephilim. And so we see that this this war was not just a war that took place in one period of time, you know, before the flood, but it was a war that would perpetuate and would continue you know, throughout the ancient world. And as Paul said, it, it's, you know, here upon our front door today. And so I, I'm a firm believer in that you can't understand modern spiritual warfare until you understand the ancient spiritual warfare. Jesus did battle with the the, the Nephilim, the, these demons. That was a major part of his ministry. So in a very real sense, Jesus was doing battle with the giants. Oh, yeah, he was. You know, it's it's kind of interesting. You have, um, you know, the, the conquest of Canaan. Right. Let's let's think about that for a minute. You have Joshua. OK, which which is Yeshua. Right. Mm-hmm. In, in Hebrew. And, and Yeshua is to, you know, utterly devote to destruction. These these giant clans. OK. And so he's he's cleansing the land of this this corruption. And then so you have Jesus Christ coming on the scene and he's also Yeshua. okay? he's or Jesus in Greek. okay? he's he's that Joshua figure, that same name. And he's coming in and he's also battling these same Nephilim giants, except now he's battling their spiritual form and not their physical form. And so you have that that, you know, history repeating itself, if you will, in the New Testament, um, where Christ is doing very similar works that men like Joshua and Moses and even David did in the Old Testament, except now he's you know showing his power over them in the New Testament. Um, so, yeah, so, so the giants don't go away. And I think that's what people don't realize. Number one, they don't realize, you know, their origin, OK, which is very sinister, which was forbidden. And then they don't understand how that perpetuates throughout the biblical narrative. Okay. You know, we, we, we tend to think, well, God's just, you know, he wakes up and he's in a bad mood and all of a sudden he wants to kill everybody in sight. Or God is so obsessed that his, his children, the children of Israel are going to live in this, you know, zip code that he is, you know, hell bent on killing everyone in its path. Everyone that resides in the land of Canaan. You know, it really paints God in a, you know, a tyrannical way where 
you know, he's not a loving God. He doesn't love people. He doesn't love children. And so there's verses, you know, where he's, he's giving the karam, if you will, that the Hebrew word for devote to destruction, men, women, and children. And uh, Derek, I, it's been probably a year ago. I was, um, you know, kind of browsing the news and I came across a, uh, a Christian artist that was basically saying they had lost their faith in God because of verses like that, where in the Old Testament, God commanded people like Joshua to devote to destruction, these certain people groups that were in the land. And so this is very troubling, you know, for a lot of Christians, I just don't want to talk about it. And a lot of atheists have a field day, you know, with the fact that, well, God, you know, devoted to destruction, men, women, and children, you know, how do you defend that? How do you, how do you defend the things like abortion? Right. When your own God commanded children to be exterminated. And so it, it's a big deal, Derek, if we misunderstand. Right. The, the context or the people that he was commanding to exterminate, which were the giant clans and their offspring, um, then we don't have a strong defense against arguments which paint our God as a tyrannical God who is hot and cold, who's loving one day and who who's you know, mean the next day. Uh, so we lose our footing if we don't understand the ancient context of Genesis 6 and also the war that was there between the people of God in the Old Testament and the people in the land of Canaan in the uh, Old Testament. And so it's so important, Derek, this is not just a topic which we can say, you know, it's not a big deal. Let's just move on. No, it is a big deal. OK, because it's any time we're studying the Bible, it's a big deal. And, and if we're serious about studying the Bible in context, OK, then first we have to bow or, or really, you know, crucify our own pet views and adopt the ancient understandings of, you know, how did the ancients parse Genesis 6, 1 through 4? And then what does that mean for the rest of the biblical narrative? And so it's been my mission as a minister you know, to, to inform people about this ancient context because of some of these arguments, uh, you know, that atheists throw at us or because of uh, some of those of the faith that are losing their faith in Yahweh, the most high God, because they see a God that's hot and cold and that can't make up his, you really can't make up his mind if he loves people or really hates people. And so, you know, we have a God that is all, that is loving. Um, and I would argue that what God did in Genesis six in, you know, exterminating the Nephilim and what God did um, in the land of Canaan were, were acts of love. And God was trying to preserve, you know, the, the people whom he created in his own image. And he was protecting them uh, from those um, of the Nephilim. And so uh, God is not a God that's hot and cold. He is a loving God. Granted, he is a God that has severity to him. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God. But God is always a God of love, and what God did before and after the flood was protection. He was protecting his creation uh, that uh, he so beautifully made to bear his own image. You make a really good point, Tyler, that uh, not understanding the reason for the conquest of Canaan and the um, devoting of, to destruction of those Amorite tribes and cities and kingdoms that were uh, sold out to these um, uh, these fallen entities, the fallen angels who uh, accepted worship as gods, leads a lot of people away. Uh, this is uh, Oprah Winfrey essentially said that it, she couldn't. Uh, uh, what did she say? It was a verse about God being a jealous God, and she just couldn't accept that God would yeah, be I remember jealous. Saying that interview, yeah, mm-hmm. and uh, and that is what led her down this new age path. And look at the influence that she's had on uh, America today in promoting these. Well, doctrines of demons, these uh, new age concepts that uh, come right from uh, the fallen realm and leading them astray. Because to our modern human senses, it seems more open minded and more loving than uh, what God is uh, recorded to have done in the Old Testament, which, again, if you don't understand what was going on, then it uh, right. yeah, it's it's a very sinister deception, and it is leading a lot of people away because it's a lot easier for us who have lost that supernatural foundation or understanding of the Bible. Uh, and survey after survey from uh, George Barna and the Barna Group at Arizona Christian University shows that uh, most American Christians don't really have a supernatural worldview. 
I mean, forget a biblical worldview. There's only 7% of Americans that have a biblical worldview. And uh, most American Christians don't have a biblical worldview in the strict sense, uh, understanding the basic concepts of Christianity. So many of us uh, who call ourselves followers of Christ think, well, yeah, he wasn't perfect. He, he's just a like, wait, what? That That's Christianity 101. Um, so it's not really that surprising that you'd find people being led away by uh the the events in the Old Testament that only makes sense if you understand that the uh, the sons exactly. of God are members of the angelic realm who like us humans were created with free will and have chosen to exercise it badly. What I find really interesting, uh, now let me let me well before I, mean, I was jumping ahead of a question here, um, you mentioned rebellions plural. And most Christians would Mm -hmm. identify what happened in Eden as one of those rebellions. We've already discussed the Genesis 6 rebellion. There is another that you dig into in some depth in your book, Gospel Over Gods. What is that and why is that one significant? Yeah, like you said, most Christians are familiar with uh, the Eden rebellion in Genesis 3, but they're unfamiliar with the other two, which we just mentioned, Genesis 6. So the third is the Tower of Babel scene. So, you know, the, the, the scene is that, you know, Nimrod, um, according to Josephus, he was kind of the, the ringleader that uh, led man astray um, after the flood, that uh, Nimrod and his uh, masons, I use that term lightly, but uh, they <laughs> built this tower to the sky. You are and, correct in more ways you know, than you know. <laughs> oh, I know. Yeah. I know. Exactly. So they built this tower to the sky. And, um, you know, it seems like, well, not a, not a bad thing, you know, in little ingenuity, never hurt anyone. And so the biblical scene lays out that, that Yahweh is upset by, you know, Nimrod and, and his tower that he built to the sky. And so it's like, well, what gives, you know, why, why is he upset? And so, um, archeologists have helped, um, helped us understand that, you know, what he was building were ziggurat. Uh, structures, which I know you have talked about in your books as well. Um, these ancient temple structures, which were used to venerate um, other gods. And, um, you know, it was also looked as a gateway um, to um, another, you know, another realm, so to speak. And so um, were they trying to build a gateway to to the gods? Were they trying to to venerate other gods? I think the answer would be yes, or all the above. And so the scene in the Bible in Genesis 10 and 11 is Yahweh says, let us go down and confound or confuse the language. Okay. And I believe that he was talking to his heavenly host or his um, divine council members, uh, which Psalm 82 talks about and, and some other passages talk about. But these angelic beings are members of this divine council. And so they they go down and they confuse the language. And so um, you don't get a lot about the angels in Genesis 10 and 11, but you do in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 8 and 9. And that's where Moses was kind of recounting, uh, looking back um, at what happened in the past. And so he said in Deuteronomy 32, 8, when the Most High or the El Yon, which that's important because uh, Yahweh is called the Elyon or the most high God, which makes no sense if there are no others. Mm-hmm. Um, but when the most high gave to the nations, their inheritance, he divided mankind and fixed the borders according to the number of the sons of God. Okay. Or the B'nai Ha Elohim. Now for many years, we didn't see this. Well, we didn't see it because it wasn't in our English Bibles. Well, the English, most English Bibles are translated from the Masoretic text. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the Masoretic text was, was good. I mean, that's all we had for, you know, a long period of time. Um, As far as Hebrew goes um, and the Masoretic text says that God divided mankind according to the number of the sons of Yisrael. Well, the only problem with that is that Israel was not a nation at the Tower of Babel. In fact, it would be probably around a thousand years later before God would call Abraham uh, to start that nation. So that makes no sense. Um, And so when we found the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1947, the Dead Sea Scrolls has mankind being divided according to the number of the B'nai Ha Elohim, Mm. bingo, right? Mm -hmm, That's mm -hmm. the same as Genesis 6, um, Job 1, uh, Job 2, Job 38, and then Deuteronomy 32, 8, and 9. 
And so the ancient uh, Hebrews understood that um, when God divorced the nations because um, of their veneration of other gods, um, he divorces them and assigns them to the very beings that they were trying to venerate or honor. And that is angels of God. And so God allots nations, different languages. He allots them a boundary and he allots them an angelic viceroy that would rule over those nations. And so um, that's exactly what the Septuagint says. The Septuagint says that uh, God divided them according to the number of the Angelon Theu or the angels of God. And so if you were a first century Christian, Derek, um, and you're reading your Bible, um, you were, you would exactly read that in Deuteronomy 32, you would read that, uh, God divorced the nations and assigned them to angels. Okay. And so that's your worldview because that's what's in your Bible. But because our Bibles didn't say that for so long, our English Bibles didn't say that, then we didn't have that, uh, angelic, um, worldview that there were angels that were ruling or spirits that were ruling over nations. And so you can uh, verify that with a biblical text, but you can also look in, um, you know, texts uh, outside the Bible, uh, such as the book of Jubilees, which says that uh, there were spirits that were put in authority over the nations. Um, and so that was the understanding for, for many, many years. But unfortunately, that that was lost again around the same time that uh, the supernatural interpretation of Genesis 6 was lost. And so for, for centuries now, you know, Christians all over the world um, have not had the same worldview that the early church had, and certainly not the same worldview that the ancient Israelites had. That was really an eye-opening moment for me. Uh, Sharon and I became aware of Mike Heiser's work back in 2005, before, well before he published uh, The Unseen Realm. But in an interview with Mike, I very distinctly remember him explaining the Deuteronomy 32, 8 paradigm and why that was important. And suddenly, the, you know, Sharon and I looking at each other while he was explaining this. And so these were the gods of the pagan nations around ancient Israel. And this was the understanding of the rabbis, you know, through the second temple period. And we're like, All right, w- what? Because <laughs> neither of us <laughs> had ever heard that. And it makes so much sense. But what uh, you've done in your book, Gospel Over Gods, which I had not done the research for, uh, and I should have because I did this for um, our book, Veneration, and and for other stuff that Sharon and I have done, just confirming that the early church understood the uh, Genesis 6 account to be precisely what it says. You also found that the early church understood that the... uh, that the understanding of Deuteronomy 32, 8 and the Deuteronomy 4, verses 19 and 20, that God allotted to the nations these angelic beings as their viceroys. Uh, this was the understanding of the early church. Exactly, exactly. And, you know, just as it was the understanding across the board in the early church that Genesis 6, 1 through 4, were the angels of God and the, um, you know, human women producing the Nephilim giants, it was also the understanding across the board up until about, you know, 400 AD that um, there were angels ruling over the nations. You know, for example, um, Clement of Alexandria, who lived about 150 to 215 AD, um, he comments in his book, Miscellaneous, he says, for by an ancient and divine order, the angels are distributed among the nations. Okay. And then you have Eusebius, which was and you know lived in around 260 to 339 AD. Um, he referenced um, this in the proof of the gospel. He said, in these words, surely he names first the most high God, the supreme God of the universe, and then as Lord, his word, whom we call Lord in the second degree, after the God of the universe. And then he goes on to say, and their import is that all the nations and the sons of men here called sons of Adam, were distributed among the invisible guardians of the nations, that is, the angels, by the decision of the Most High God and his secret counsel unknown to us. So that was, again, across the board, that was the understanding the early church had. That was the understanding the church at Corinth had. That was the understanding the church at Ephesus had. And so when you begin to think about it in those terms, that the churches to whom Paul was writing, Okay, the early recipients of those letters, the early readers of the Gospels, they were reading 
this material. They were reading the books of the New Testament. They were reading the Old Testament um, with the lens that even during that particular period of time, that there were still angelic viceroys who were over the nations. Now, these angels ended up rebelling, as you talk about uh, and Sharon talks about in your excellent books. Um, And so that's where you get into some other passages in the Bible, um, such as Psalm chapter 82. Mm -hmm. And Psalm 82 is is, uh, very, very eye-opening. You know, it says... Um, in, in Psalm 82, that, um, you know, God takes his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment, or Elohim Nitzah Ba'adat El, Pekar of Elohim Yishpot. Uh, that is, the most high God was standing in the midst of other Elohim, okay? And so that that is a, a, a mind blower for most Christians, just to understand that there were other Elohim besides Yahweh, Okay. And so I think probably like me, Derek, you grew up thinking that uh, when you read these small G gods in the Old Testament, that uh, those were simply sticks and stones. The imaginary friends of the pagans. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. They were the product of um, imagination, Um, which makes no sense. You know, why would Israel leave the most high God and serve other Elohim or other gods that don't exist? So that always troubled me. But but when you recover the context that the most high um, is the, exactly that. He is the most high God and that there are other gods that are subservient to him. And one of the ways I like to de, you know, describe it to other people, I've told this to my congregation, is to think of it in these terms. Okay, um, Coke is a soda, but no other soda is a Coke. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you have different sodas. You have uh, Sprite, you have Dr. Pepper, you have Coke. All of those are sodas, but no other soda is a Coke. So Yahweh is an Elohim, but no other Elohim is Yahweh. Okay, He is species unique. He is the creator of all other spiritual beings, all of a Ruachs or spirits or all other Elohim or gods um, or, you know, all other um, Malachim or angels. And, and he is the creator of all of those beings. And so once you understand that, then you can, you know, put your guard down and, and, and listen to what the text says. And so, you know, the text says that, you know, God takes his place in the divine council in the midst of the gods. He holds judgment. And so God, the most high God, Yahweh, the creator of all things, goes on to scathe those rebellious gods in Psalm chapter 82, or those angels that were put over the nation whom rebelled. And um, I love the way that psalm ends. It ends with great hope by the psalmist. Um, The psalmist speaks at the very end of that chapter, and he says, Arise, O God. And judge the earth, for you shall inherit all the nations. And I love the fact that that word arise in the Septuagint, in the Greek version, is anastasis, the very word that the New Testament uses for resurrection. Hmm. And so there was a little foreshadowing going on there, you know, that the idea that God would take back the nations from those angels whom rebelled at Babel, and he would do it by his resurrection. He would arise or he would raise himself from the dead. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so that is a, a, a very, very critical psalm uh, in the Old Testament that helps bring some of that together. There's a, uh, and this only came out in research that I'm doing for my forthcoming book called Saturn's Reign. There's an alternate translation uh, for Psalm 82, verse 1, because the phrase translated divine counsel in Hebrew, and forgive my pronunciation because I have not studied it. I I need to. Uh, Adat El can also mean Mm -hmm. the assembly of El. Now, El was the creator God of the Canaanites, not to be confused with El Elyon, you know, God Most High or El Shaddai. So that would render that verse. And this is the way the New English translation renders Psalm 82, verse 1. God stands in the assembly of El. In the midst of the gods, he renders judgment. In this context, the way they've chosen to render it, Yahweh shows up in the midst of this infernal council led by El, the creator God, who I'm arguing in my forthcoming book is to be equated with Shemiyaza, the chief of the watchers. Um, And presumably this would be taking place on Mount Hermon, which makes Jesus' choice of his location for the transfiguration even more significant. Um, In other words, God shows up and kind of busts up this infernal council and says, because you have ruled unjustly, you 
viceroys who were placed over the nations, like men you shall die and fall like any prince, which is uh, pretty cool when you think about it. Uh, that's not a theological hill I will die on, but uh, either way you, you look at it, it's, it's either God well, rend- rendering judgment in a heavenly courtroom scene, or he invades a secret meeting of the, uh, the rebels to say, you're all going to die. Right. So, yeah, yeah, I think I think you're onto something there, Derek. Um, and it, maybe it's a combination of both. Maybe it's um, God's um, loyal loyalist or God's loyal angels, you know, attending uh, that mountain of El mm-hmm. um, and busting up that uh, that courtroom scene uh, where, um, you know, he rules from his uh, his mountain. Of course, uh, you, you have some of that language also with Baal or Bell. Mm-hmm. Um, as well, you know, in, in the old Testament. Um, and so it, it, that, that's very interesting. And so obviously the, the biblical writer chose to use not, um, Elohim, uh, but he, he chose to use the word L, which is sometimes, you know, attributed to Yahweh, the most high God, perhaps mm-hmm. as a polemic, um, against, you know, that, um, that Canaanite deity L that most high God in the, uh, the Canaanite pantheon. And so, um, I certainly see that as a, a very real possibility. Yeah. One of the things I like about the New English translation is that the translators made their notes available so you can look at why they chose a specific rendering of a sentence over another and uh, just helps get a deeper understanding of what the translators for each translation that's available to us had to wrestle with. Because some of the Hebrew is archaic. You don't always have context. Uh, you don't always have other usages of the word throughout the scriptures to see how it's used in other contexts. So, um, yeah, interesting. That- right. And, you know, for, for so long, we were missing the, uh, the, you know, the text from, you know, you go or the Ugaritic text. Right. Right. And so, you know, recovering texts like that, you know, brings, brings us a lot. I like to say it brings us tape on the enemy. You know, it's kind of like when a football team studies film, they, they get film on the enemy. Well, well, when we dig up and find these very ancient texts, you know, such as we found at uh, Ugarit, mm-hmm. then um, we have tape on the enemy. And so it, it gives us some insight into that, which, you know, talks about uh, El and, and, and Baal and some of these other um, gods. And so it, it brings context to the, the biblical text itself, because we now know, you know, who they're talking about. Mm-hmm. It's uh, fascinating. We're literally in the first generation to have access to some of this research. Some of the things that uh, have come out about the Nephilim have only been translated from the Ugaritic texts within the last 40 years or so, even though they were found 100 years ago. Some of these, mm-hmm. um, it's, it's a miracle that these baked clay tablets, and they were only baked because the city was destroyed by raiders sometime around 1200 B.C., um, in some cases, they've been damaged. And so it's amazing that those little marks that were pressed into the clay with the end of a cut reed still survive. But scholars argue, OK, mm-hmm. is that this or is that that? And what does this mean? And uh, within just the last 20 years, we've had some groundbreaking research from scholars like Amar Anus, who I see that you uh, cite a number of times in uh, in your book here, oh, yeah. uh, including one of the articles that I, th- again, jaw dropping. I've had to read through it about 12 times to try to get my head around it. Uh, are there Greek Rephaim? Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, that's wh- a great one. What did you get out of that article and how did that uh, shape the uh, shape your book? Well, the answer is yes, there are. Um, and, you know, he is just a he's he's a brilliant mind. And, um, you know, I, I really much appreciate, uh, you know, his work. Um, but, you know, you come across, you know, certain passages um, in the Bible that um, really kind of jump out and grab you. And, um, you know, some of those were, you know, the idea of the Valley of Rephaim. I believe it's in the uh, first or second Samuel uh, maybe it's in chapter five um, where, you know, our English Bibles say that they were in the Valley of Rephaim, but in the, uh, the Greek Septuagint or the LXX, um, it says instead of Rephaim, it says the Valley of Titanon or Titans. And so there's two places in the LXX that just come out and, and associate the Rephaim with the Titans of Greek mythology. And so that's that's uh, that's pretty huge, you know. That's that's uh, that's not a, a a minuscule detail, okay? It's it's because they understood again, 
um, that the giants of Greek mythology were the uh, giants of the Bible. Okay. And you, there, there's some overlap there. And I try to get into that. I have a section in my book that deals with um, Greek mythology um, and the Bible and, mm-hmm. um, you know, our kids growing up in, in public schools or going to college or whatever, they study some of these texts from, from Greek mythology. And, um, one thing that I hope my book does for re- for its readers is I hope it, uh, connects, um, the ancient worldview, uh, all of the ancient worldviews into one worldview, um, because, you know, they were neighbors, you know, the Israelites were not living in a bubble. Um, the ancient, uh, their ancient neighbors were not living in a bubble. Uh, the Greeks were not living in a bubble. And so they all share the same uh, worldview. And that is a uh, the same cosmology, an angelic um, allotment worldview. And Plato talks about that in his writings as well. And so when you understand that, you know, these Greek writings are talking about the fallen angels and the giants of the Bible, then you really have to back up and, and say, now, wait a minute, this is this is pretty big stuff because... You know, what is it that we can glean, you know, from Greek mythology that uh, once we have that uh, understanding that the Bible has at least some overlap between Greek mythology and the Bible, what can we gain from those texts? And so it's just, uh, you know, pretty eye opening to to dig in and to see these correlations. You know, another one is um, the idea that, uh, you know, Peter and Jude talk about the angels uh, were locked under, you know, um, Tartarus or Tartarao or mm-hmm. Tartu, you know, forget the, the, the correct pronunciation of that. Forgive me. But um, that was a word that was used um, again in Greek mythology uh, where the, uh, the, uh, I believe it was the, uh, the Titans were buried mm-hmm. in uh, Tartarus. And that's exactly where um, one of the apostles said that the angels who sinned were locked under gloomy chains of darkness in this very place. And so why would he say that if there was not some truth to this ancient understanding of Greek mythology of the Titans being locked in Tartarus? And so, you know, again, they shared the same worldview. And I think that's what's so critical, Derek, is the message that you and I are trying to get out is the fact that the gospel of Jesus Christ, when understood properly, okay, when parsed properly, it works in any part of the world. Okay, that's key, because I have to admit, before I had this understanding of the ancient context of the Bible, uh, my worldview was very limited. I can only reach very few people that were, you know, probably raised very similarly to, to you know, to me. But when you have these ancient understandings that, um, you know, these angels are the gods of the nations, then you can literally go into all the world and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and reach that audience. Okay. But without that worldview, without that understanding, uh, then you're probably you know, you you're going to miss out on you know some tremendous opportunities that you have to teach people, you know, with the ancient lens of Scripture. Completely agree. Um, our, our daughter had to go through uh, w- went through public school and was very excited to learn about uh, Greek mythology. And when we uh, began down this path of, of study, Sharon and I. Uh, our, our daughter, Nicole, was was she she got it. You know, and I forget how young she was at the time, nine, 10 years old. Just, dad, dad, this means that Hercules was was a Nephilim. It's like, yeah, that's that's exactly <laughs> what that means. Uh, and that was the reason that we wrote the book Giants, Gods and Dragons to try to, you know, e- equip adults to say, hey, all of these weird characters that are in the Bible, God says they're real. And if you really believe the word of God, then. We need to start avoiding. We we need to stop avoiding these strange sections of scripture because if we convey this sense that hey, you know, read Job forty one, kids, and and tell me what you think that uh, that is that uh, God is describing there. They're not going to say it's a crocodile like most Bible teachers, mm-hmm. you know, learned right. biblical commentators. They will understand what God is. Do- okay, so we got dragon there. We got the dragons that uh, are in the Book of Revelation, of course. And, uh, the, you know, the terrible beast of uh, Daniel chapter seven and uh, and, you know, God calls these. Uh, they're getting this kind of um, fascinating narrative in, in the form of entertainment. You know, the Percy Jackson and the Olympians series and uh, all forms of stuff coming out of Hollywood that uh, you're, portrays. You're these- so right. I just watched 
I just watched the Godzilla. Um, well, there you go. You know, movies recently, and they were talking about the Titans in the underworld, right? Okay? You know, in Hollow Earth, and so it's it's all there, Derek. It's all around us. Um, I, I literally took a screenshot. I, I couldn't believe it. And I was watching one of the Godzilla movies, and um, literally, you had uh, kind of the nemesis. Uh, I forget his name, but he had three heads. Oh, King Ghidorah he was standing. Yeah, he was standing very sinisterly on this mountain in a far. Yes, yes. And then very close to the camera, you could see the cross of Jesus Christ. And right. so there's this this uh, view of, you know, the dragon and the cross. And mm-hmm. so it's all around us. And one thing that I've noticed, Derek, is I've been teaching this in my congregation, and people are coming to me and they're saying, you know, Tyler, I'm seeing this imagery everywhere, literally everywhere. I mean, once you're once you're awakened to um, this ancient context of scripture, then you're, you're just, you know, you're bombarded. It's just all around you. Um, you just can't get away from it. And so it really makes you wonder, um, you know, how much knowledge a lot of these uh, movie writers and filmmakers have. And apparently they have tremendous knowledge. Um, and a lot of it, I think, is intentional. I think, you know, there's a lot placed in these movies um, that are, you know, kind of foreshadowing certain events or um, it's just kind of a way of, of bragging about their worldview that, that the Christians that claim to have the light are totally ignorant of, you know? So it's just amazing to see all these things come to fruition in, in the realm of Hollywood today. It's, it's the greatest uh, rebranding campaign, marketing campaign in all of history. The Titans, the original and rightful rulers of earth is how they're described in the, uh, uh, I think Godzilla King of Monsters was the previous film and uh, Godzilla versus Kong. Again, the hollow earth and the whole right. uh, uh, s- setting there. I know we've only scratched the surface uh, of this and uh, I was fascinated by uh, your, your uh, exposition on Psalm 91, which is something Sharon spotted a couple of years ago. She did a wonderful presentation on that for uh, last year's defender conference, um, realizing that it's not just a prayer for warriors, but it's actually spiritual warfare and, and names spiritual entities, supernatural entities by name that have been sort of translated out of our English Bibles. But I want to I want to get to one final question here to keep this to a, a manageable uh, length, because we could go on, I'm sure, for several hours digging into uh, the, the subject of <laughs> your could. book, uh, because, yeah, my head's been in that research for the last five years now. Um, how is your congregation as a pastor of a church? How is your congregation responding when you bring these subjects, topics into church on Sunday morning? Well, I have to be honest with you. It was um, it was a, it was an uphill battle at first, for sure. Um, um, I'd only been in this congregation for about a year when I started teaching a lot of this material. And so I wasn't, you know, tenured. I wasn't well established here. And so that was uh, one thing I had against me. But um I had some, some hesitant, I guess some hesitant uh, folks, you know, to, to jump on board at first. I didn't have anyone leave the church over it by any means, but um, the more I taught this material, which by the way, I taught the material in my book before I put it in uh, uh, print form. So um, my congregation has went through most of this material. Um, and so I had some, you know, some pushback, but not a lot of pushback. Um, they were just thinking, well, who is this preacher we hired? You know, where did he, where did he come from? <laughs> What's what in the world is he thinking? Um, but now if you were to ask most of my congregation, they would, uh, say that, you know, a lot of this material was foreign to us, but, um, it's backed by the Bible. And, um, I had one young man, um, that I taught the material to at least a lot of the material to, um, of my congregation that, um, I did not realize, um, you know, some of the things he was going through, um, at the moment, but, um, he later told me that, um, this material saved him from, um, from suicide. Oh my. And so, yeah. And so it, it was that important to him, um, to see the, the full picture of scripture, um, and, and to, to realize that the world that he lived in was not um, so foreign to what the Bible stated, but that it was in line with the Bible and we are in a war. And so, um, very early on, I had that, um, that happen. And he told me, he said, you know, he said, what you taught me, it, it saved me from committing suicide. And so that was very humbling, very sobering. Um, 
and so, you know, I, we're, we're a congregation here on the Gulf Coast that, that we have a lot of vacationers um, come through. Before COVID hit, um, in the summertime, we would have anywhere from five to 700 folks on Sunday morning. And um, I would say um, at least half or almost three quarters of those um, are vacationers. And so I have a unique opportunity that God has given me to reach a lot of different people every single week. Um, now, since COVID, um, we're, we're running around 300, 400. I think this summer we're, we're going to hit probably five, um, 550. But um, I have a display set up, and it's, it's on my mind. Trust me, it's on my mind to get this information out to each and every person that comes through uh, our congregation this summer because I, I want them to know of the things that are in this book, because I believe that um, men and women of faith are not fighting the Christian fight because they don't believe. I'm not saying they don't believe in God. They certainly believe in God, but they don't, they don't believe in the fight. They don't see the fight uh, for what it is. They don't understand the, the background to the fight. And so I'm of the opinion, Derek, that once Christians are awakened to the great deception once they are awakened to the the real battle that we are in, then they will pick up their swords and they're they're going to start fighting and they're going to be on fire for God. And so it's it's uh, I've taken a road less traveled. Let's just say that you don't have a lot of pastors or preachers who are um, out front talking about this stuff. But I believe that's uh, the, one of the missions that God has given me uh, to use my influence and my platform to help spread the, you know, the message of the gospel. And so I hope that um, I continue to have that opportunity here at Gulf Shores. And, you know, I pray that my congregation will use this material um, to help spread the gospel all over the world. So, well, I've, I've heard similar things as well, and I, t- I take no credit for it because I'm slow to uh, this fight. Uh, you know, Dr. Michael Heiser's done just incredible work in, in getting this information out to the body of Christ and making so much of his research freely available. But uh, all we're doing is trying to recover what the early church knew. We've kind of lost it for about the last 1600 years and uh, bringing exactly. us back, back into the, uh, the body of Christ. So uh, Gulf Shores, Alabama, y- y'all are very close to uh, Pensacola, correct? We are. Yeah. Pensacola's about 50 minutes away. We go there quite a bit, my wife and I, and uh, we like to, Uh, go eat, eat at some restaurants over there. And so we, uh, yeah, we do go there pretty often. So we're right here um, on the Gulf coast. We're in between Pensacola and Mobile, Alabama, if you're familiar with that area. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a spot that more and more people are starting to discover. Um, I'm telling you, it's, it's, it's just blowing up. It's just unbelievable how many visitors come through um, during the summer months here in Gulf Shores. And not just the summer months. We have a lot of snowbirds that come down from the north, and mm-hmm. they like to come uh, stay here when um, when it gets cold up north. And so we have some members that we call our snowbird members who are just <laughs> here several months out of the year. And so it's an interesting dynamic down here at uh, this congregation. But I love it because most people that move here, they didn't grow up here, obviously. And so most of our congregation are people that don't have family in the area. Mm. And so what that does, it creates a unique environment where you begin to rely on members of the church more so than in other places that have, you know, cousins and aunts and, and brothers and sisters in that area. So it's a, it's a very unique uh, dynamic, but um, it's it, I'm loving it. It's it's awesome down here. It really is. You need to come visit. Check it out. Well, that that may happen one of these days. You're not all that far then from uh our good friend, Pastor Carl Gallup, who also understands this worldview. He's over in Milton, Florida, which is just northeast of Pensacola. So uh, maybe God is drawing a... uh, Yeah, I want to get together with him at some point. Well, he's he's a good man and uh, uh, a great friend. He's got a a really, really interesting book uh, on the way uh, not uh, in the not-too-distant future. Uh, Yeah, Pastor Tyler Gilreath, he's the author of the book Gospel Over Gods. You can find out more about the book online, gospelovergods.com. And if you happen to be... In uh, South Alabama, the uh, church's website is gulfshoreschurchofchrist.org. And uh, Tyler, enjoyed the uh, the conversation, and we pray this book gets into the hands of uh, a lot of our listeners. Well, I appreciate you having me on the show, the invitation, and uh, I wish you and Sharon nothing but the best. And I can't look, you know, I, I really can't wait for the new material you guys put out. And uh, it's just always interesting. Uh, you know, it just amazes me the amount of research uh, that you guys put into your material. And so I've only written one book, and it you know, it took everything out of me. <laughs> I'm just not recovering. <laughs> and so um, my hat's off to anyone 
who is a writer, you know, who just keeps pumping out material. So uh, I wish you and Sharon nothing but the best. Tyler Gilreath, gospelovergods.com. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Check the show notes for the links to Tyler's website for the book and for his church. And straight ahead, YouTube cancels Skywatch TV. I'll tell you about that next on A View from the Bunker. Where were you on 1013? As the Middle East erupts in chaos, a devastating wave of terror shocks the nation. Thousands lie dead. An apocalyptic Christian cult is blamed. And suddenly, believers disappear as internment camps spring up almost overnight. Meanwhile, a deadly virus spreads. A desperate country demands answers. And only a few dare ask, what's in the vaccine? FBI Special Agent Joe Eunice follows a trail of evidence to a small town in Iowa and a young boy who received a mysterious email from God. Now, racing against time, Agent Eunice finds himself working side by side with reclusive internet broadcaster Barney Eisen. Together, they discover a disturbing truth at the center of the conspiracy. They wrestle not against flesh and blood. The God Conspiracy, a novel by Derek P. Gilbert. Get it now in paperback and Kindle. From Rose Avenue Fiction. Driving the internet to think. This is A View from the Bunker. I'm Derek Gilbert. You'll find us online, vftb.net. Uh, social media, Twitter, at View from Bunker or at Derek Gilbert. We've also got a Facebook page. You'll find that under View from the Bunker. On Gab and me, where you'll find me at Derek P. Gilbert. And uh, as of now, we're still at uh, YouTube under uh, Derek Gilbert, the account. Maybe don't say that too loud because... Uh, uh, we seem to be attracting some of their attention lately. Uh, if you've followed Skywatch TV for the last six years, you'll notice that a Thursday this past week, all of a sudden, the YouTube channel for Skywatch TV just abs- just disappeared. Blink of an eye, gone. We woke up Thursday morning to uh, emails and messages from friends saying, hey, what happened? Uh, I can't find you on YouTube. And it turned out, well, lo and behold, it's because we're not there anymore. We're not there. We... Uh, got spiked by YouTube because they, uh, I guess, were triggered by the most recent broadcast program on Skywatch TV, which dealt with the documentary by Josh Peck called Silent Cry, The Darker Side of Trafficking. Now, that documentary exposes child sex trafficking and specifically trafficking for the purposes of occult ritual abuse. Why that would trigger YouTube into reviewing our channel and accusing Skywatch TV specifically, and I'm quoting now, of harassment, threats, and cyberbullying, end quote, I have no idea. I don't know what it is about the, because in the program about the documentary, nobody was called out by name. Nobody was called out and, and harassed or threatened. And I would challenge anybody any fair-minded person to go back through the more than 2,000 videos that we've uploaded to the internet over the last six years from Skywatch TV to find a single incident of a threat of public harassment or cyber bullying. And of course, it's bogus. I'd, I'd like to use a harsher term, but I won't. It, it's bogus, but it doesn't really matter. I mean, YouTube is allowing content providers to post videos for free and so they get to set the rules of who gets to play there and what and and how you get to play so they don't like your politics okay you're canceled and that's pretty much what happened or we don't like your theology okay you're canceled they will allow jihadist videos but somehow skywatch tv is dangerous because we're threatening or harassing people. Well, the previous week they had uh, canceled or deleted rather a uh, an episode of Sci Friday, and this was actually a rebroadcast. We've been uh, essentially repurposing older episodes of Sci Friday just to um, continue to put content out there 
And especially for our friends down at Morningside, PTL Network has been carrying Sci Friday and a number of networks now on their broadcast network. Uh, they've got, uh, they're on a number of cable channels. It's, it's really coast to coast now, PTL Network. And uh, rather than leave them without a program until we get the Bible's Greatest Mysteries, the new program Sharon and I are working on, until we get that out there, we didn't want to leave them with an empty time slot. So anyway, we, re- we repurposed a program from last April in which we discussed uh, Bill Gates' vaccine initiative, not even specifically related to the COVID vaccine, just that Bill Gates has been promoting vaccines for years and uh, that this is connected, uh, or at least there was an article that we referenced last April that connected to, to a group called ID2020, which wants to uh, build a global uh, ID database, which would contain all information, uh, your health information, health records, vaccine records, and so forth. And so this, again, this was sourced information. We don't get into speculation Sharon and I, yeah, we're not in the mainstream of thought. We're certainly not going to fit in with uh, Fox News or anything like that. But by the same token, we don't rely on Internet level research. We're, in fact, we got a lot of pushback from people who follow Skywatch TV because we said specifically, A, the COVID vaccine is not the mark of the beast. And you have to read the book of Revelation because you see there's a lot of stuff that happens before. Where's the beast? The beast has to be here for the mark of the beast to roll out. Now, this may look like what the mark actually looks like, but this, the vaccine, is not the mark. Secondly, mRNA vaccines do not change DNA. That's not how human biology works. It's not how biology works. DNA encodes RNA, not the other way around. That's, I'm sorry, that's just high school biology. And because we said that, there were people out there. In fact, one ministry who's, I just, I won't get personal about it, but actually accused Skywatch TV in general and me specifically (laughs) of being an agent of the Israeli government for saying that. I don't see how that follows. Anyway, the point is, we didn't say anything that wasn't backed up by a mainstream news article. Last April, when that show first ran, it was fine. And yet this time around, Sky, it was it was spiked. YouTube deleted that new episode, left the old one up there, but deleted the new one for spreading medical misinformation. I challenged it, said we didn't even talk about covid vaccines on the program. Not specifically, we weren't saying anything about the covid vaccine or in its efficacy or lack thereof, but it didn't matter. YouTube decided it was uh Wrong think. And so they spiked it. And um, here we are like a week and a half later, and they just deleted the entire channel. Now, we, we saw this day coming because we're not the first ones to be targeted. So I'm not crying poor us or anything like that. Just making you aware of what's going on here. YouTube decided to cancel Skywatch TV because they don't like our theology and or politics. They've gone after other ministries before. Josh Peck, who's like the nicest guy you will ever want to meet. They canceled his Daily Renegade channel. Basically for the same reason. And it's not because he's harassing or threatening or cyber bullying anybody. It's just they don't like his content because he's openly Christian. As are we. So, uh, you know, and and we've seen this from other video content providers as well. Vimeo has done this. Uh, They were spiking some of our Sci Friday episodes again for making allegedly making claims, which we never said. In fact, one of the episodes they uh, they pulled, I re-uploaded with a new title and they let it slide. So, you know, whatever. Um, but they also interrupted a virtual conference, actually a couple of virtual conferences from a couple of different ministries, friends of ours. Um, one of them was because I did a presentation on the spiritual backdrop of the uh, BLM practice of saying the name of those who have fallen in confrontations with the police, their, their ritual, and that's what it is. It's a ritual. And I even played in my presentation video clips of the co-founder of BLM and uh, the head of the Los Angeles chapter talking about this uh, ritual where they literally are summoning the dead. They believe that they're summoning the spirits of the dead in their words. And I put that video a clip up there so that they... So it wasn't me saying it. I couldn't be accused of twisting their words because that's them on the screen saying it. And then just 
pointing out that this is almost identical, or at least very, very similar to the ancient Kispum ritual of the Amorites of Abraham's day, where they had to summon their ancestors by name to a ritual meal, pour out a drink offering in order to feed them in the afterlife. It's the same thing that was going on 4,000 years ago. That was the point of my presentation, but that got a, uh, an entire conference yanked offline by Vimeo. Uh, another one from another. So anyway, the point is, we saw this day coming. We backed up all the videos to another a Christian company called Subsplash. They're the ones that serve up the videos for our uh, uh, Roku and Apple TV channels. It's also the mobile app. So all of that comes from Subsplash. So all of the content is there. Now, I will say this. Unraveling Revelation. Uh, kind of got caught on that one, that uh, the archives for Unraveling Revelation are current back through last June. Uh, I'm going to have to go and re-upload the stuff from the previous year, from July of 2019 through June of last year. I'll do that on Monday at uh, at the office. But uh, other than that, YouTube thought they were going to really put a hurt on us by knocking out 2,000 videos of ours. Didn't happen. Uh, They're all online, and we've moved over to Rumble. So Skywatch TV now has a channel at Rumble. All new content will go at rumble.com, and I'll put the link in the show notes. Um, The archives are all available at skywatchtv.com. Go to Skywatch TV if you want to see the archives. Everything there uh, should be good, with the exception, like I said, of the the the, uh, Unraveling Revelation archives. But everything else... That's there should be good. This, though, is um, just another reminder that we are in a spiritual war and that the uh, folks who think that they have a monopoly on access to information via the Internet are becoming more and more bold about exercising their power to cut us off one from another. And so there are other options out there. Subsplash is one. Rumble is another. There are other channels out there that are... uh, finding workarounds to get around YouTube, to get around Vimeo, to get around daily motion and other video content services. And uh, just, we're just going to have to get used to, um, well, we should be canceling YouTube. I mean, YouTube has canceled outspoken ministries like Skywatch TV and others. Why do we still keep going to YouTube to look for funny cat videos, for example? Because that's why YouTube exists. They sell ads. And if we keep giving them eyeballs, they're going to keep making money. So why not go to Rumble, where they're a little more friendly to conservative voices and conservative Christian voices, or just bypass it altogether. Download the free mobile app for Skywatch TV. Got an iPad, got an Android tablet, smartphone. You can bring all of that content right into your device. Bypass these gatekeepers. And uh, just, you know, carry us around with you. Uh, Besides, the mobile app not only has the video content, it's got news that uh, Tom Horn curates three times a week. And it's uh, stories that most of the mainstream media would just as soon you not read. So that plus a a calendar of upcoming events, uh, you'll find links to the app stores at skywatchtv.com. But uh, that's the reason you're not seeing Skywatch TV on YouTube anymore. It's because YouTube just unilaterally decided we were apparently a threat to society. So praise God, count it all joy. It means we're over the target, especially because it was talking about child sex trafficking, the evils of abusing children that triggered YouTube into yanking Skywatch TV's channel. Isn't that interesting? Well, less than two weeks away from the launch of Skywatch TV's Defender Conference, Rise 2021, at midnight or 12.01 a.m., if you will, on uh, June 18th, 50 hours of presentations will be Available to you to binge watch on your schedule, binge to your heart's content for 90 days, June 18th through September 18th. The cost is $95. Tom Horn's presentation alone is two and a half out of those 50 hours, but (laughs) he's the man, so no worries there. And Josh Peck is doing the production on this. It'll be like last year's presentation. It will essentially be a documentary 
by the time Josh is done with it. Uh, best-selling authors like Joel Richardson, Mark Biltz, Carl Gallups, dynamic speakers like Jamie Walden, Bishop Ron Webb, Dr. Michael Lake, Rabbi Zev Porat, prophecy experts Troy Anderson, Colonel David Giamona, archaeologists Dr. Scott Stripling, who heads up the dig at Shiloh in Israel, Dr. Judd Burton, Dr. Aaron Judkins, Ken Johnson, talking about uh, his research into the Essenes. Josh Peck has done three presentations dealing with the material in his forthcoming book on the Essenes and what they saw coming in the end times. I've got material coming from from my forthcoming book, Saturn's Reign, on uh, the occult symbolism built into the art and architecture of the United States Capitol. This really builds on Tom Horn's book, Zenith 2016, and takes it uh, even further. So that and much more. Jimmy Evans, another end times prophecy expert, a geopolitical a geopolitics expert, Lieutenant Colonel Robert McGinnis and more. Um, sign up online, DefenderConference.com, DefenderConference.com. And then come September, we are looking to be uh, in California. And uh, as of now, things are looking really good. The Warriors Conference from Here the Watchmen, September 16th through 18th at the Legacy Resort Hotel and Spa in San Diego. This is a Christian-owned hotel. As of right now, the Transportation Safety Administration is saying that uh, there will be no more mask mandate as of September 15th. So just in time for this conference, no more mask mandate. And the hotel has advised Mike and Jeannie at Here the Watchmen that the uh, limit on the crowd has been lifted. So whereas before they were saying a maximum of 200 in the hotel, now 600. So we can actually get back together. The Warriors Conference, September 16th through 18th at uh, Legacy Resort Hotel and Spa in San Diego. Uh, Sharon and me, Pastor Paul Begley, Colonel David Giamona, David Hevener, who, by the way, is also contributing a presentation to the uh, uh, RISE 2021 virtual conference and more. And you can find out more online at hearthewatchmen.com, hearthewatchmen.com. Appreciate you taking time out to uh, listen to this program wherever you're finding us. That's Spreaker, Stitcher, Apple Podcast, Google Podcast, Amazon Music, Spotify. Appreciate you taking the time out and uh, inviting us into your ears. Our announcer is DC Good. And a view from the bunkers of production of Gilbert House, released under Creative Commons Attribution, non commercial, no derivatives, 4.0 international license. We do this because we wrestle not against flesh and blood. I'm Derek Gilbert, and this is a view from the bunker. <laughs> <laughs>